Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Valeria Rumori, and I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles. I would like to welcome you all to this webinar, Italian Fashion for a Cause, the Franca Suzzani Fund for Preventative Genomics, featuring Dr. and our professor Robert Green and director Francesco Carrozzini, who will share his story and inspiration for the fund dedicated to his mother, a late editor for Vogue Italia, Franca Suzzani. Dr. Robert Green will present scientific evidence supporting preventative genomics. This event has been organized by the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles and the Franca Fund in collaboration with the Italian scientists and scholars in North America Foundation and Gaia Ceccaroli Communications NPR. Dr. Robert Green is a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School. Worldwide leader in preventative genomics, he has led the scientific field in generating evidence for the medical, behavioral, and economic utility of preventative genomics. He directs the BabySec project, a first of its kind research study exploring the best ways to use genome sequencing in routine pediatric care to keep babies healthy. In his clinical practice, he provides evidence-based genomic evaluations for individuals seeking to anticipate and prevent future illnesses. Francesco Carrozzini is an accomplished filmmaker and son of the late Franca Suzzani, iconic longtime editor and legend of Vogue Italia. Francesco has partnered with Robert Green to create the Franca Fund, which supports preventative genomics research and honors the legacy of Franca, a creative pioneering woman who revolutionized the fashion world. Most recently, Francesco helped launch a Zara clothing line with 100% of proceeds donated to the fund. After the conversation between Dr. Green and filmmaker Carozzini, I strongly invite you to ask, and you can do that also during the presentation, you can leave them there, using the Q&A tool in Zoom. So you're welcome to ask as many questions as you like. Finally, I would like to thank sincerely Dr. Robert Green and filmmaker Francesco Carozzini for their invaluable collaboration. It is now my great pleasure to welcome to the screen, Francesco Carrozzini. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you for everyone for joining. Um, you know, I have to say a couple of words of why we even are here and how uh, someone like me met someone like Robert, uh, apparently from two completely different worlds. Um, I've always been interested in science. Um, I've always been interested in in, in anything that would push boundaries in general. Um, and science in this moment, I think, is one of the most interesting fields doing so. Uh, my mother was um, a trailblazer, was someone who definitely pushed boundaries in her own way with, um, with her magazine, Vogue Italia, that um, reached the, the heights of being called the fashion Bible at one point. So um, I, um, I've, I grew up in a world where um, challenge was, uh, was, was something that was happening every day. And um, one day, uh, my mother got sick, and this was about um, five years ago. And um, it, 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 always, it, it showed right away that it was not going to be something um, that was probably fixable. But as I turned to left and right to try and understand what was going on with her, um, I met, um, and I already had met, but I decided to go and see Robert at Harvard. And um, I felt almost like that was, uh, you know, someone who could help me try to understand it was my, my only uh, scientist friend. Uh, and so, or, or, you know, a friend of mine introduced us and I just went there trying to understand what, what could I do uh, to save my mother, which is something very natural and that everyone else would have done in my place, I guess. So very relatable. Um, Obviously, there wasn't much to do. In fact, my mother sadly died a few months later. But um, through Robert, I came to know the field of genomics or genetics. Um, and uh, 
I fell in love with this. I completely fell in love with the, po the potential. I fell in love with what was happening at the time. And in these five years that we've known each other, I'm falling in love every day with the progress and where this um, field is actually uh, taking us as a society. Um, there's obviously a lot to um, still figure out. There's a lot of, of evidence to be still um, shown, but Robert, um, the same way I always compare him to my mother and he's the, the scientist version of her, um, is really able to push every day um, those boundaries and show evidence that will and is already um, changing the world. So I am extremely passionate you know, on a very personal level. And so I decided that um, to do something in order to remember my mother, um, the, the, the fund, this, this fund uh, that we created would support um, Robert's work. Um, Robert will, of course, tell you way more specifically what his work is about, what genomics, what preventive genomics even means. Um, I'll let him do this because I'm not a scientist and uh, I wouldn't do it justice. Um, but um, I invite everyone to really enter this kind of magical world um, that Robert uh, lives in every day. Thank you so much, Francesco, for that extremely generous introduction. Um, welcome everybody. And I'm so pleased to be here and so proud to be part of this world, uh, not only of genetics, but to be able to reach across our scientific boundaries and touch so many different worlds through my friend Francesco, who has introduced me to worlds of fashion and entertainment and extraordinary people like uh, Valeria and Gaia, who um, I would never meet in my ordinary life. So this, this relationship has been uh, delightful in many, many ways. I'm gonna sh to just speak to you for about 10 minutes in a lecture format. And then I hope we'll actually, you'll feel comfortable typing questions and together, we will all try to answer some of those questions because uh, Francesco is being very modest. He knows a lot of genetics at this point. And um, more, more importantly, perhaps as a filmmaker and photographer, he knows stories. And what we're finding out is that the way to change society, the way to change our world isn't just science, it's science and storytelling. And so uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say that partnering with Francesco has not only, of course, helped us with some resources that are supporting our research, but has literally upped our game in terms of being able to talk about the stories, present the stories, communicate the stories. And uh, that is having so much more impact on the world than, than I had before I, I met him and the network of people in, in his world. So let me uh, show you some slides and it won't, it won't take too long. Um, and uh, just to kind of introduce you to the topic. So the, the topic I'm gonna talk on today is about genetics uh, or really about genomics, which is the word we use for many, many genes evaluated at once. And then I'm gonna finish up with our most exciting project, which is I think the Global Baby Seek Project. So just a couple of slides as a primer. Remember, your, every cell in your body has DNA, and that DNA is packaged in these chromosomes. But what it really is is long strings of chemical letters, A's, T's, C's, and G's, that constitute approximately uh, 20,000 genes that code for all the proteins that are made up that make up every part of your body. So they make up your blood and your skin and your hair and your organs. So it's kind of like the blueprint for your whole life. Uh, now it doesn't, it doesn't explain everything. That's one of the misconceptions. It's not like a crystal ball that's gonna tell you everything. But as you're gonna hear, it tells you quite a lot that we haven't yet started using in the practice of medicine. Now, if I, uh, it's, a, it's kind of amazing and very humanizing how similar we are to each other. There are 3 billion of these chemical letters and we are exactly the same, every human being in about 99.9% .9 of them. 
So it just kind of reminds you how closely related we all are when the world seems concentrated on our differences. But about one every 1,000 of these letters, there is a difference. Lots of these differences are just random. Some of these differences tell us where we came from, our ancestry, and some of these differences influence our health, how long we live, what diseases we're going to get, and so forth. Now, just a couple of vocabulary words. Like I said, your genome is sort of this entire three billion letters that makes up your DNA. If you hear the word exome, that makes up just the 20,000 genes that are the kind of factory part of your DNA, the, the part that's actually producing those proteins. And then in genetic medicine, there's also um, uh, 5,000 of these genes, only 5,000 that we know for sure are linked to human disease. And then when you send your DNA off to a laboratory, most of the time they're just testing a few of these. And the big breakthrough in the last few years is that it's become cheaper and faster mm -hmm. to sequence all 5,000 of those disease associated genes or even all 20,000 of your exome or even the entire genome, what's called whole genome sequencing. And um, that used to be uh, actually $3 billion for the first one. And then for a long time, it was six figures. Now that whole genome sequencing has come down to between $400 and $800. The other lesson I just want you to make sure you understand, because this is a, a very common misconception, is the difference between genotyping and sequencing. Genotyping, like Ancestry.com does or 23andMe does, is a very cool technique where you look at specific places in your DNA. So you look at one place on one page if your DNA was a book, and then you flip the pages and you look at another place. But it's not comprehensive. That's why they can sell it at this lower price point for, for these direct-to-consumer offerings. Sequencing is every letter of the particular genes that you're sequencing. And if you're talking about whole genome sequencing, it's every letter of every gene in your entire DNA. Now, genetics has been around for a long time, but traditionally it's been that there's a child who's born with an abnormal heart or an abnormal face or an abnormal uh, skin. And we have been trying to use mm -hmm. genetics to understand the molecular etiology of this. But genetics has really changed lately. And here are the hot areas that are coming in genetics that are sort of almost here. The first one is population screening. Why is it that your doctor, everybody out here who's listening to this, why hasn't your doctor said to you, have you gotten your genes tested yet? And it's because the, <clears throat> this, the practice of medicine hasn't really agreed on the value and the cost effectiveness of population screening yet. We're almost there. One step behind this is newborn sequencing. Why isn't every baby being born having their DNA analyzed to understand this blueprint of their uh, biology that could be useful for the rest of their life? Again, we're almost there and our, our research is hopefully helping. Uh, and then there are these other areas that are almost there, what's called polygenic risk score, adding up thousands of genetic markers to find who's, who's at risk for heart disease and diabetes. Prenatal sequencing, actually taking a, a sample of the mother's blood to predict what the fetus is likely to suffer from if they are at risk for something. Expanded carrier screening. Those of you who are gonna have babies in the world, I would tell you, you should never have a baby again without knowing what recessive carrier traits you're carrying and your partner are carrying. Uh, right now, we're just rolling the dice. And expanded pharmacogenomic testing. Uh, the time is coming very soon when your doctor will not give you a medication without first checking your DNA to see if you're a rapid metabolizer or a slow metabolizer mm. or have a genetic predisposition to side effects. So this is the landscape of the next five years of genetics. And this is the area that most of my work is in. Just beyond that horizon is such exciting stuff, gene editing, actually changing the nature of your genes. 
and then integrating genomics with all these other sources of information, the Apple Watch you're wearing, the glucose monitor you might be wearing, the environment around you, the air you're breathing, uh, all of these things will be part of medicine, precision medicine of the future. Robert. So, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think it would be useful if we could make a couple of examples of mm -hmm. benefits that we have found or you have found both with baby seek, but also with like pharmacogenomics with like women being, for example, not uh, receiving birth control. You know, I think a couple of examples would, would be useful for people who are not really familiar with the topic. That's a great idea. So um, as you're going to hear, we do a little, we, we have been leaders in the area of sequencing healthy adults as well as sequencing healthy babies. And what Francesco has seen, and we won't be showing today, uh, but I'll, I'll happily send you a link for these, are examples of people who found they were carrying a life-saving mutation. So for example, we've now had many adults who find that they have a predisposition to sudden cardiac death. And yet by avoiding certain medications or being monitored in certain ways, they can drastically reduce this chance. In the, in the babies, uh, a good example, Francesco, is the baby I've mentioned before that had an elastin mutation. That's a gene that when it's damaged, causes your aorta, the big artery in your body to expand and occasionally burst. And we found a, a baby who was absolutely normal, rosy cheeks, normal heart sounds. And yet when we uh, learned, we saw this mutation in this baby's DNA and we looked at their aorta, it was already starting to expand. Now, we didn't have to do anything urgently, but you know, if that baby goes out on the playground and, and, and has a fainting spell at age uh, four or five, we're gonna look at that baby very differently from the ways in which we would, might look at them if we didn't know this information. Um, I'll just finish up and we can have some more examples uh, by <clears throat> saying that there are a lot of things that have converged <clears throat> lately. Uh, DNA, the, the, the uh, direct-to-consumer DNA testing, um, the Angelina effect who, when she announced that she was a carrier of a BRCA1 mutation, which is moving us toward population screening, toward every single person, you, your family, your neighbors, um, your friends, being uh, seeing the value of using genomics, but we're not there yet. And if you were to ask, me, as a lot of people do, what are the chances that I'm carrying something? Actually, the chances are like 100%. Almost everybody's carrying a recessive mutation that will influence, could influence the health of their children. Most people are carrying a, a change in their DNA that will influence how they metabolize medications. A striking 15% of you are carrying from <clears throat> birth a dominant mutation that would is mostly could increase your risk of cancer and heart disease. And about 50% of you, in the sound of my voice, are at high risk for one or another common diseases like diabetes. Finally, um, we're going to be focusing on newborns, but this is a lifelong journey. And so you think about your DNA as helping you at every stage of life and ultimately expanding longevity and healthy longevity. So finally, I will just say our, our flagship project now is uh, the baby seek study. We were the first ones in the world to enroll a couple hundred babies and sequence them. We now have a, a, an NIH supported grant that is expanding that to 500 babies uh, through the Franca Fund. Um, honestly, we would not have been able to get this second grant without the Franca Fund because we held our entire team together with funding from the Franca Fund while we struggled to get this um, grant. You might not think this is revolutionary, but it's, it's rather <laughs> um, unique in the medical world. And now we have even bigger aspirations. We have this idea that we should encourage this all over the world. And instead of 500 babies, we should do 1,000 babies in this study. And we should expand that to 5,000 babies and 10,000 babies and 100,000 babies until we have the stories, the outcomes, the impact, and the storytelling that will make this a reality for the future. I just want to say thank you to, uh, particularly to Zara for this Zara tribute that Francesco mentioned. 
Uh, this is a line of clothing until February that um, will actually support our research if you want to think about that for your Christmas shopping. And um, I want to thank the, uh, the, the Fashion Institute for inviting me today. And I want to leave this up for a moment uh, to let you, if you're interested, uh, note our uh, website, our Twitter, our Instagram, and my personal email. And anybody who's on this listening to this who would like to get themselves sequenced, their children uh, evaluated, or just ask a question about genomics, um, uh, your friendship um, is uh, important to us and we would be happy to respond. Robert, I want to- So let me pause. I want to close here, the yeah. story before we, um, we ask mm -hmm. Gaia also, who's a very important part of your team to speak. Um, yes. You know, because I think the, your presentation was so clear and, you know, there's there's something that really I feel I want to say <clears throat> to bring really home the message of preventive medicine, right? Like, of course, we are at the avant-garde of any preventive medicine, right? Um, and uh, but 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 even detaching ourselves from the ge genomics part of it, the how important the concept of preventive is and what we're doing is in terms of studying babies and all of that. You know, it, it's, I had a baby 10 days ago and my mother died because there's an under, you know, the, there was an undiagnosed, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, which is not necessarily genetic, but it, it, everything is genetic. So, um, you know, she might've been, we might've been able to save her. We didn't. I don't want my kid to go on a playground, as you said, when he's five and drop dead because we didn't know he had something this simple to prevent so i just want to make sure because you know there's this stigma about medicine that is always like something you 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 have to go to to fix problems but actually medicine is not something that needs to fix problems medicine needs to foresee problems and and that's really the cultural shift that i think people um, should really try to understand thank you, to you i agree Raya. Sorry, I want you to step in one second, Robert and Francesco. Francesco, thank you for saying that. Actually, it's all about prevention and it's very true. And that's why today we're partnering, I like to stress this once again, with the ISNAF, which is the Association of Italian Scientists and Scholars in North America, a foundation. It's a very important foundation because we do strongly believe also with the Italian government in science and that science is key in uh, let's say in the next generation's futures too. So I'd like to thank you for pointing that out and also for you know the beautiful and short presentation that Robert just started. Sorry, I just uh, just wanted to reiterate that concept. Thank you. So Gaia, would you like to make yes. a few remarks? Yes. Hi. So uh, thank you, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and honored. And uh, I just wanted to talk directly to the people that are listening to us. I just want to tell you that I'm just like you. I am not Robert Green. I don't have a PhD in medicine, genetics. I'm not like a big deal. <laughs> so I'm just a regular person that, uh, thanks to Francesco, has been involved in this uh, field of genomics. And um, when Francesco said pre preventing medicine is the future, is is exactly what we should uh, uh, what we should pay more attention to um, is right because uh, thanks to this project, I had my genome sequenced, and uh, what I found was extremely important for my health um, and potentially life saving. So I have, I've wrote it down because again I don't have a PhD in, in genetics, so I discovered that I have. Uh, a malignant hyperthermia risk, which basically means uh, uh, that I could die if I was ever given a certain type of anesthesia. Uh, it's a very common type of anesthesia. So uh, I never had a surgery uh, in my life, uh, but you know it's it's very common. Maybe I, I will have I, I will have my wisdom teeth removed. Maybe I will, have, I will have to have my appendix removed. And uh, now I know. So Robert Green wrote a letter uh, that I have in my phone. I printed and I talked to my physician about it. 
I talked to other of my doctors about it. So now I know, for example, recently they told me that I should do a colonoscopy and did mean, that means that I should have a, uh, an anesthesia. But I talked to my doctor and I told him and I say, hey, read this letter, please. <laughs> so this is potential life savings. And this is, this is, pre is it, this is my prevent, uh, it is prevention. And uh, I'm very happy that I did that. And uh, thank you, Francesco, for involving me in this project. You really opened like a world. And I, every time I, I go out, I talk to people about it. And uh, exactly, people like you that, that are watching us right now. And thank you, Robert, for, for saving my life. Um, because you did, <laughs> actually. So uh, I'm very grateful. And um, thank you again. Thank you, Valeria, to let us this opportunity to, to talk about it in a very, um, let's say, relaxed way. Um, and um, that's it. So I'm just a regular person that uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to have her, her life saved. So grazie. <laughs> grazie mille, Robert and Francesco. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gaia. Um, you know, and, and I don't think, I think it's a probabilistic thing. Not everybody's going to find a dramatic finding like that, but everybody will find something. And a few people will find a very dramatic finding uh, that could influence their, their health and, e and even their life in the future. Um, there's a question or comment, I guess, from Manuela in the Q&A, um, a, a beautiful testament to uh, having worked with Franca. Um, and then she asks, is the study of DNA and genomes going to make a difference in how we look at people, their races, and everyone's genetic makeup? What a great, great mm. uh, comment. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the things, Manuela, about genetics is, as I mentioned, it shows how similar we are. And that, you know, the color of our skin may be different or where we come from in the world may be different. Um, but the DNA that makes us up is so similar between us all. It reminds you uh, truly of our common human heritage. Um, genetics has been used for evil in the past, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. I think we are past that. And genetics is actually um, more a way to bring us together than anything else. Now, having said that, there are some specific markers that do help indicate where you come from in the world. And some of those are uh, intersect with health such that it, we can't simply develop our science in people of European ancestry and expect it to always work in people from other parts of the world. We must incorporate uh, people from all parts of the world, particularly underrepresented minorities in our research. And I'm very proud that our research, again, with the support of the Franca Fund, is the first to sequence African-American healthy adults the first to return results in an all African-American epidemiology study in Jackson, Mississippi, and the first to return results to uh, African-American and Hispanic newborn babies. Uh, this doesn't happen by accident. You have to develop stakeholder boards, community <clears throat> outreach, a tremendous amount of commitment and work by our entire team. But again, these are the extras that when, when, whenever you get a fund, a, a grant from NIH, you barely have enough to do the research. And when, um, when there is support from uh, uh, friends and, uh, who, and, and really investment in the future from friends who are supporting the Franca Fund, um, it allows us to do a remarkable amount more. Um, Francesco, I would sort of, uh, ask you a question. As you've gone around the world, learned about this and gone around the world and sort of started talking to people about it, have you been surprised at some of the stories you've heard back from people um, about their families and about what it means to them? Quite separate from our research. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, of, I, I also, um, as, as Gaia was mentioning, I got, see, the first thing, if, we, if you remember, um, after we I met, did. I got sequenced um, I had my wife uh, sequenced um, because it was, again, important for us to find out what 
um, you know, what, what we had to, what we, what we could have, if there was more to find out, we didn't find out that much because there wasn't anything uh, dangerous of a notice, but like what would have happened when we would have had a kid. And now we've had this kid and, um, you know, and, and he's healthy and now we're going to sequence him um, and, and hopefully <clears throat> find out, um, you know, something that could be useful for him. Um, what I really see being um, for, for people very interesting is um, the idea of finding out some, you know, there's, there's two groups. There's the group that my mother belonged to, unfortunately, which is the group that um, thinks that you go to the doctor when you're sick <laughs> and 95% of the time it's late. Or there's the group uh, that says, well, um, actually, no, I am interested in finding out because if I am Gaia and I don't know this, and one day I go, uh, I get in a car accident and they put me in anesthesia and then, oh, the person died. And how did she die? Well, you didn't know that she had a condition, right? So it, 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 it's, re it's not really answering your question, but what I see you know, happening when I talk about this is the, oh, no, I would never want to know. And the, please tell me because I can save myself, which is, you know, important to most of us. But even more now that I'm a parent and you are a parent and you know this, uh, Robert, is our kids because that's where all of our efforts are, right? So that's why I'm very proud of the fact that not only we support all the studies um, that we do, but we support for the most interesting one to me and personal to me right now, which is newborns and, and what an incredible chance we have to change um, medicine and society, you know. Exactly, and it's not gonna be easy because, um, you know, again, people listening might think, oh, that seems logical. We should uh, sequence those babies. But there is a huge tradition in medicine that's holding us back. And, and some of it's for good reasons. There are ethical concerns. The babies themselves aren't choosing this. The parents are choosing it for them. Uh, there are privacy concerns, there are discrimination concerns, there's concerns about um, whether it would even disrupt parent-child bonding. Uh, some of our research has actually been able to answer some of those questions and actually put to rest some of those concerns. Now, you know, again, the storytelling is part, in part, how do we get that mm -hmm. message out there? And Gaia, you're you're particularly, I think, skilled at storytelling um, with regard to helping helping people get their message out. What 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 are some of your thoughts about um, messaging this? Yeah, so we discuss a lot about the the messaging here, and um, I think that like um, the most important thing is like we said it before: our stories. Stories like my story, stories like Baby Cora, for example, uh, that we had the, um, the opportunity and the chance to, to listen. We, we had the mother of this baby who discovered uh, something very important for the health of, of her baby. And I asked Robert to invite the mother of this baby to, um, to join our board, board meeting uh, because as again, people, the, the, the driven uh, is not like, uh, it's not just, just science, but it's just, we need to touch the hearts of our people. And that's, I think that the, the, our biggest challenge because um, you, Robert, are a, are a man of science, but thankfully we have Francesco, who is a, a filmmaker and a photographer. And I think that uh, here we have, the opportunity to 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 make our message uh, better. So um, I just wanted to say something about the the baby seek project and about the messaging. Uh, we're talking about the biggest uh, the like Ricardo Sabatini and our great uh, scientist said that the baby seek project is the grand experiment. So it's the first and biggest experiment uh, on uh, on babies in genetics. And we should be very proud of it because we are not only um, improved the science, but we are actually saving kids, saving babies. And that's very important. And uh, um, I feel that we're putting seat belts on all of these babies somehow mm. because we are, you know, uh, 
we're driving, but we have we have a seat belt on. And uh, you maybe don't think about it. Every time you you put your seat belt, you don't think about it. Oh, this is actually something that is saving my life. But it does. Same uh, having uh, your genome sequence. So I encourage uh, everybody to have their baby sequence because you're literally giving your child an opportunity to, to be safe. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the message, I think. Uh, we're saving lives. We actually, we're doing that. We're saving babies. So, yes. Thank you. So if I might step in for a second, Robert, you know, we're not experts by any means, as Gaia was saying, rightly so. Francesco probably is more knowledgeable than we all are. But let's say uh, a general question that people might have also in our audience, uh, I believe how, let's say, do we start, let's say we're talking about future generations and of course it's tremendously important, I mean, that's paramount. But if we want to start with ourselves today, what should I do? Let's say I, Valeria, want to get tested. What should I do and where should I go? And the second question is, I don't know, that's a bit, you know, probably many people are thinking the same, how reliable, how accurate is that to tell me something about my future chances of getting sick or not getting sick? Because as we rightly said with Francesco, you know, the first opening lines were, this is about preventative genomics. It's not, That's right. let's say, we, we, we want to know in advance. So if you can talk a bit about that, Robert. Because... I'll answer to the second question, Robert. You answer to the first one. So I'll answer <laughs> okay. to the second one as a, as a normal person would. Okay, so the first one is how accurate is it? Um, you know, it so the first one is what would you do? What would you oh, want to? What, what do? You, yeah, to get sequenced. Yeah. To get sequenced. Okay, so um, right now there's no commercial way to get your baby sequenced uh, easily. Uh, we are doing it as part of a research protocol in three cities. We're trying to expand that research protocol into six or eight mm -hmm. more cities. Um, and we would love to speak to anyone who's interested in that. And it, it will take some doing, but we can help, you know, if, if a family is really dedicated to this right now, there are ways to do it that, that are legitimate and that we can help you do. If you are an adult and you would like to get sequenced, which is a great way to start, um, then I think you would just uh, contact me at that email that I, that I pointed out. Uh, I'll put it back up on the screen. And we will, um, depending on what state you're in, uh, we can do that by telemedicine and we can we can get you started. Um, so that that's, I, is that the first question, Francesco? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was the first question. Mm -hmm. I think everyone in the, in the audience might have, and also the future ones, because this webinar will be, video recording will be available on the YouTube channel of the Institute. So people might ask that. So it'd be great, Robert, if you could share that, uh, that the, the slide again with all the information. And I invite everyone in the audience to, to ask questions in the Q&A section of Zoom. Yeah, there's sure. there's an interesting question uh, from Marina, which we, we'll, I think um, Robert can, can tackle and I can help um, as well. Um, yeah. But to answer to your second question, um, so this isn't, um, you know, the, 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 the reason why we're doing what we're doing and we're doing research um, is because we have yet to prove a lot, okay? So this is not um, a magical tool, okay? That will tell you that at 1056, uh, you know, a vase will fall. This is, this is unfortunately not magic. Um, it is a science though, and it's very accurate science that now it's basing itself on a lot of data, more and more. Um, it's obviously being integrated with um, you know, uh, by a, a lot of other um, uh, how do you say uh, types of, of medicine, but let's let's step back and let's um, you know let's take the example of um, breast um, cancer screening. Okay, um, it's it's obviously very accurate. It's obviously something that is very important to do, and it's been adopted by everyone as a preventive tool. Um, the Angelina Jolie effect, you know, the, the mediatic power of that story um, got so much attention on this. But if we talk 20 years ago, how many women would get this, this kind of screening, right? So the, this is a very good example of how things are progressing. 
Now, colon cancer is another cancer that you know kills a lot of people. What kind of screening do we do for colon cancer? Way less than what we do for breast screening. Um, there are there are other hundreds of cancers, you know, that we could actually um, you know find markers for. Well, then this doesn't mean you're going to get the cancer, but this means you have a predisposition, which means, you know, you it, it's 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 not a hundred percent that you're going to get it, it, which is in fact also an interesting part of this. It's you're not cursed forever. You know, you have a predisposition. What does that mean? That means the same way when you have a cancer, you know, a, a BRCA gene, that you're going to get screened regularly. Now, this is the issue is people don't get screened regularly because people, in fact, don't want to get a blood taken when they go once a year to the doctor. Who likes that? No one. Who wants to do it? No one. Who likes washing their teeth? No one, but it's really good for you, you know, and it's the first preventive uh, tool, med medical tool that we've, we're, we're using every day. So we do have to do things in order to prevent and um, the accuracy of science is refining every day it's getting you know more and more precise um but it's not you, once you find a gene that doesn't mean you're going to certainly get the cancer okay or the uh disease whether there are alzheimer's in another example um well now this opens a whole different set of questions which i think are very interesting and are related to um you know uh, first of all uh, ethical questions, right? Like, what do I do if I get told that my kid has Alzheimer? Like, will I tell him? What do I do for, you know? So there's there's these set of questions. And then there's discrimination questions, right? Um, which are very, both very interesting. I'll let, I'll bounce it back to Robert and then I'll, I'll, I'll take some of it as well. You're going strong there. I 100% agree and beautifully described. And just to pick up that thread, uh, Marina asks about the ethical safeguards for uh, future discrimination. And Marina, that is a genuine concern, particularly because there is a federal law that does some protection, but not complete protection. However, the tide may be changing. For example, in July of this year, in the middle of a pandemic, the state of Florida passed the most uh, complete protection of any state in the country for insurance discrimination. You will not be discriminated against from genetics in the state of Florida in any kind of insurance. And there are four or five states following on trying to get similar things passed. So it's, it's not quite there yet, but the tide is going in the right direction. And although there is a risk of future discrimination, maybe 18, 20, 50 years for your child, You've got to balance that against the possibility that you would find a treatable condition today. Did you know that one in 135 babies is born with a genetic condition, some of them mild, some of them severe, that is actually treatable? And probably less than half of those are actually detected in our current newborn screening paradigm. Um, Marina also sort of asks, uh, well, no, actually in the chat, um, Daniela also asked ethical questions about unnecessary termination of pregnancies. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that as long as pregnancies can be terminated uh, for no cause at all, uh, there is a possibility that women will choose to terminate pregnancies based on medical information. But you're obviously correct, the medical information has to be accurate. And then Daniela also asks a really sophisticated question about additional factors besides genetics. Um, obviously, somebody who knows their science. And, uh, you know, we don't take that into account at all at this early stage of baby seek. She's asking about epigenetics and post-transcriptional RNA modification. Uh, we know that that's important. And we think that getting started with newborn sequencing in uh, just DNA only will then allow us to layer on those additional layers of sophistication as time goes by. Um, Sorry. Let, me, let me also take a moment to show you the Franca Fund page because I'm so proud of this. You know, our, our scientific webpage 
is kind of klutzy, but um, influenced by <laughs> Francesco and others with a lot more style than we have. Um, I love this beautiful picture of Franca and um, we've noted the Zara tribute on there. And we should also note the other co-founder of this fund, uh, D.A. Wallach, the uh, uh, singer songwriter and now um, actually life sciences investor. And thanks to the incredible network that people like you have brought us, uh, this has now been mentioned in Vogue and Forbes and the New York Times and social media. Uh, you, can, you can sort of check out some of the science here. You can check out more about Franca herself uh, here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can check out ways to potentially get involved yourself, including uh, getting yourself sequenced. That, this might be the easiest. Uh, you can contact us through here, schedule an appointment, uh, learn about our research, um, and uh, even, even donate if you're so moved. So um, this is, we're very proud of this relationship and honored to be uh, a small part of Franco's legacy. As we are really, you know, um, this is uh, incredibly uh, thought provoking. Also, what can we do? As Robert was saying, Francesco, I mean, or Gaia, do you have, it, Gaia was talking about messaging and I can see how Francesco conveys the message in a very, very knowledgeable way. He says, you know, he doesn't know about genetics, he but does. he does apparently more than we all do. So what can we do? I mean, to all of you, uh, what can we do? I, Robert just said we can get tested ourselves, but also to spread the message or to do something, let's say people like us who don't have, let's say newborn babies that can be enrolled in that. And final question from me to Robert is, you were mentioning a few states about you know, ethics, those very important ethical issues. And how about we're based as you know, in Los Angeles. So how about the state of California? Where, where's the state of California in all this? Yeah, thing? California is pretty strong. It's not quite as strong as Florida, but it's got pretty good protections in place against discrimination. But let me toss it back to Francesco and Gaia for maybe they could summarize what people could do if they're interested in learning more or supporting us. You know, I think for, from my point of view, um, it's, it goes back to the, the stories. You know, I, I ultimately came to Harvard one day, you know, <clears throat> I could have gone to so many other places. I could have done so many other things. I could have got interested in, but I, 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 I found you and I found your story uh, and what you were doing very interesting. And it was interesting to me and it was interesting for me. And I kind of found my own, um, you know, personal reason. I, I, I think it's about, you know, there's uh, in, in, um, in, in, um, in this great book I read about directing um, before I, I directed my first feature last summer. There's a, there's, a, there's a quote that says, you know, you need to personalize your material. And I think that's kind of one of the best uh, ever um, advices I've ever gotten and I got it from a book. Um, and it really is that you have to find your own personal um, kind of attachment to this story. I don't think it's very hard to do because we're actually talking about reading the code of life um, that makes all of us extremely different, but also very, very similar. So, you know, whether that's because you think you can do something for yourself or for others, uh, whether you think you can do something for your kids or just because maybe, and I think there are people that are, you know, want to do that. And I'm one of them. Maybe you want to invest in the future of the world. You know, the same way you try not to throw plastic away, the same way you try to buy an electric car, um, this is as important, you know, there's, 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 there really are many issues that are going to make this world different, but this is definitely one of them. Understanding that we actually can avoid a lot of, uh, pain and disease. And so, um, and just live a better life, you know, very simply. I mean, it's, that's kind of what we, you know, why we eat in a certain way, California better than others. Um, you know, that's why we try to adopt certain lifestyles. That's why we do what we do to, to live a better life. And this is definitely a life improving, um, you know, opportunity. And, um, and so I invite everyone to get involved however they can, whether that's 
getting sequence and telling their story, supporting us, um, introducing us, um, helping us throw a dinner, uh, helping us fundraise, whatever. You know, I we've all we're all wearing a lot of hats and we're all very um, motivated. So, um, Thank you so wants to get involved. Francesco. I, I don't know if we have time. I've seen there is another question there. Um, if you want to answer, maybe there is a uh, final question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it says, are you working with any Native American tribes? Are you working with any African countries? Um, we are not. Our um, diversity efforts are focused on underrepresented minorities in the United States, African American and Hispanic communities. And, and that's, a that's, a, that's a heavy lift for us. Um, just this week, I spent um, seven hours preparing for uh, a panel at NIH where I had to justify the budget for uh, the first genomic project to bring return of results to Latino, uh, Latinx, and, and Hispanic communities. Um, and they were tough. I mean, it was like being on trial. Uh, but we did it, and we are, you know, that's one of 27 steps to try to get funding for that from, from NIH, and we're going to pursue it. Um, there are other people doing some amazing work in Africa. There's something called H3 Africa, which eventually hopes to do millions of genomes in Africa. Um, and there are other people, particularly University of Washington, uh, just to name one, that are working with uh, indigenous peoples and their genomes. Um, Gaia, did you, did you wanna though, before we, before we wrap up, did you wanna tell people yeah. uh, a few more of the I, practical I things that they could do? Yeah, so since we're, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, the BabySeq project and our uh, efforts are on the fundraising here. Um, so if you want to be part of it, if you want to help us to uh, keep um, doing research uh, in this project, uh, there's a lot of ways to, to help us. And uh, just go to the Franca Fund website and uh, you can find, uh, it's Franca, francafund.org. You can find, uh, you know, how to be involved. You can have your genome sequence. You can, uh, like Francesco said, uh, spread the voice, um, host a dinner, uh, the fundraising dinner. And you can also uh, donate directly from uh, the website uh, with some interesting donation tiers. And you, for example, you can donate the first level. You're going to help us to enroll one baby in the project. With the second donation tier, you're gonna help us to enroll two babies in the project. So you're gonna help us to uh, to fundraise. So and to help us to find other stories, other babies to to help and to save. So thank you for for that in advance. So thank you all. I think it's time to wrap up. I would kindly ask Robert if he can share another time that slide with all the information so everyone can look at it. Sure and thing. yeah. So uh, the, here are some basic uh, information about our program and my personal email. I'd be happy to respond to anybody who emails me. And then uh, the other website that you saw was francafund.org. Um, and uh, there is both a Twitter and an Instagram that is francafund uh, as well. So please follow those uh, as well as these that are mentioned here. So thank you so much to all of you. A truly captivating presentation. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you. And thank thanks you. to Isna for uh, partnering with us and Gaia, of course, for your collaboration. And thank you all for attending today's inspiring conversation. As you can see, the Italian Culture Institute of Los Angeles not only promotes, as everyone knows, Italian language, but also culture and not just arts, but in all its forms can be music, can be science, architecture, cinema, of course, with Francesco. Actually, we promoted Francesco a few years ago at, um, for his first uh, feature film at a film festival. Uh, design, literature, technology, theater, and much more. In an effort to continue offering a rich program during the pandemic, the Italian Cultural Institute of Los Angeles has been organizing webinars and online events, which are also posted on our YouTube channel. Please don't miss our coming virtual exhibit presented with Teatro La Scala in Milan, Caruso Corelli di Stefano, Italian opera legend, celebrated the 100 year anniversary of his internationally acclaimed tenors. 
projects, and then we start on November the 22nd. On November the 30th, the Institute will also host an online exclusive Caruso tribute concert by Tenor Pasquale Esposito. Please follow us on our social media channels, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, for daily posts on Italian culture and Italy. Again, thank you for attending and you're all invited to our upcoming events. Grazie. Thank you. E arrivederci. Grazie. Thank you very much. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.